Section 17 of Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne Spiegel. Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 1, by John G. Nicolay and John Hay. Section 17. The Circuit Lawyer. In that briefest of all autobiographies, which Mr. Lincoln wrote for Jesse Fell upon three pages of note paper, he sketched in these words the period at which we have arrived. From 1849 to 1854, both inclusive, I practiced law more assiduously than ever before. I was losing interest in politics when the repeal of the Missouri Compromise aroused me again. His service in Congress had made him more generally known than formerly and had increased his practical value as a member of any law firm. He was offered a partnership on favorable terms by a lawyer in good practice in Chicago, but he declined it on the ground that his health would not endure the close confinement necessary in a city office. He went back to Springfield and resumed at once his practice there and in the Eighth Judicial Circuit, where his occupations and his associates were the most congenial that he could anywhere find. For five years he devoted himself to his work with more energy and more success than ever before. It was at this time that he gave a notable proof of his unusual powers of mental discipline. His wider knowledge of men and things, acquired by contact with the great world, had shown him a certain lack in himself of the power of close and sustained reasoning. To remedy this defect, he applied himself, even after his return from Congress, to such works upon logic and mathematics as he fancied would be serviceable. Devoting himself with dogged energy to the task in hand, he soon learned by heart six books of the propositions of Euclid, and he retained through life a thorough knowledge of the principles they contain. The outward form and fashion of every institution change rapidly in growing communities like our western states, and the practice of the law had already assumed a very different degree of dignity and formality from that which it presented only twenty years before. The lawyers in hunting shirts and moccasins had long since passed away, so had the judges who apologized to the criminals that they sentenced, and charged them to let their friends on Bear Creek understand it was the law and the jury who were responsible. Even the easy familiarity of a later date would no longer be tolerated. No successor of Judge Douglas had been known to follow his example by coming down from the bench, taking a seat in the lap of a friend, throwing an arm around his neck, and in that intimate attitude discussing, quorum publico, whatever interested him, David Davis, afterwards of the Supreme Court and of the Senate, was for many years the presiding judge of this circuit, and neither under him nor his predecessor, S. H. Treat, was any lapse of dignity or of propriety possible. Still, there was much less of form and ceremony insisted upon than is considered proper and necessary in older communities. The bar, in great measure, was composed of the same men who used to follow the circuit on horseback, over roads impassable to wheels, with their scanty wardrobes, their law books, and their documents crowding each other out in their saddlebags. The improvement of roads, which made carriages a possibility, had effected a great change, and the coming of the railway had completed the sudden development of the manners and customs of the modernized community. But they could not all at once take from the bar of the Eighth Circuit its raciness and its individuality. The men who had lived in log cabins, who had hunted their way through untrodden woods and prairies, who had thought as much about the chances of swimming over swollen fords as of their cases, who had passed their nights, a half-dozen together, on the floors of wayside hostelries, could never be precisely the same sort of practitioners as the smug barristers of a more conventional age and place. But they were not deficient in ability, in learning, or in that most valuable faculty which enables really intelligent men to get their bearings and sustain themselves in every sphere of life to which they may be called. Some of these very colleagues of Lincoln at the Springfield Bar have sat in cabinets, have held their own on the floor of the Senate, have led armies in the field, have governed states, and all with a quiet self-reliance which was as far as possible removed from either undue arrogance or undue modesty. Footnote. A few of the lawyers who practice with Lincoln and have held the highest official positions are Douglas, Shields, Logan, Stewart, Baker, Samuel H. Treat, Bledsoe, O. H. Browning, Hardin, Lyman Trumbull, and Stephen T. McClernand. End footnote. 
Among these able and energetic men, Lincoln assumed and held the first rank. This is a statement which ought not to be made without authority, and rather than give the common repute of the circuit, we prefer to cite the opinion of those lawyers in Illinois who are entitled to speak as to this matter, both by the weight of their personal and professional character, and by their eminent official standing among the jurists of our time. We shall quote rather fully from addresses delivered by Justice David Davis of the Supreme Court of the United States, and by Judge Drummond, the United States District Judge for Illinois. Judge Davis says, I enjoyed for over twenty years the personal friendship of Mr. Lincoln. We were admitted to the bar about the same time, and traveled for many years what is known in Illinois as the Eighth Judicial Circuit. In 1848, when I first went on the bench, the circuit embraced fourteen counties, and Mr. Lincoln went with the court to every county. Railroads were not then in use, and our mode of travel was either on horseback or in buggies. This simple life he loved, preferring it to the practice of the law in a city where, although the remuneration would have been greater, the opportunity would be less for mixing with the great body of the people who loved him and whom he loved. Mr. Lincoln was transferred from the bar of that circuit to the office of the President of the United States, having been without official position since he left Congress in 1849. In all the elements that constitute the great lawyer, he had few equals. He was great both at Nisi Purius and before the appellate tribunal. He seized the strong points of a cause and presented them with clearness and great compactness. His mind was logical and direct, and he did not indulge in extraneous discussion. Generalities and platitudes had no charms for him. An unfailing vein of humor never deserted him and he was able to claim the attention of court and jury when the cause was the most uninteresting by the appropriateness of his anecdotes. Footnote. C. P. Linder once said to an Eastern lawyer who expressed the opinion that Lincoln was wasting his time in telling stories to the jury, Don't lay that flattering unction to your soul. Lincoln is like Tansy's horse. He breaks to win. T. W. S. Kidd in the Lincoln Memorial Album. End of footnote. His power of comparison was large, and he rarely failed in a legal discussion to use that mode of reasoning. The framework of his mental and moral being was honesty, and a wrong cause was poorly defended by him. The ability which some eminent lawyers possess of explaining away the bad points of a cause by ingenious sophistry was denied him. In order to bring into full activity his great powers, it was necessary that he should be convinced of the right and justice of the matter which he advocated. When so convinced, whether the cause was great or small, he was usually successful. He read law books but little, except when the cause in hand made it necessary, yet he was usually self-reliant, depending upon his own resources and rarely consulting his brother lawyers, either on the management of his case or on the legal questions involved. Mr. Lincoln was the fairest and most accommodating of practitioners, granting all favors which were consistent with his duty to his client, and rarely availing himself of an unwary oversight of his adversary. He hated wrong and oppression everywhere, and many a man whose fraudulent conduct was undergoing review in a court of justice has writhed under his terrific indignation and rebukes. He was the most simple and unostentatious of men in his habits, having few wants, and those easily supplied. To his honor be it said that he never took from a client, even when his cause was gained, more than he thought the services were worth and the client could reasonably afford to pay. The people where he practiced law were not rich, and his charges were always small. When he was elected president, I question whether there was a lawyer in the circuit who had been at the bar so long a time whose means were not larger. It did not seem to be one of the purposes of his life to accumulate a fortune, in fact, outside of his profession, he had no knowledge of the way to make money. He never even attempted it. Mr. Lincoln was loved by his brethren of the bar, and no body of men will grieve more at his death or pay more sincere tributes to his memory. His presence on the circuit was watched for with interest and never failed to produce joy or hilarity. When casually absent, the spirits of both bar and people were depressed. He was not fond of litigation, and would compromise a lawsuit whenever practicable. No clearer or more authoritative statement of Lincoln's rank as a lawyer can ever be made than is found in these brief sentences, 
in which the warmth of personal affection is not permitted to disturb the measured appreciation, the habitual reserve of the eminent jurist. But, as it may be objected that the friendship which united Davis and Lincoln rendered the one incapable of a just judgment upon the merits of the other, we will also give an extract from the address delivered in Chicago by one of the ablest and most impartial lawyers who have ever honored the bar and the bench in the West. Judge Drummond says, With a probity of character known to all, and with an intuitive insight into the human heart, with a clearness of statement which was in itself an argument, with uncommon power and felicity of illustration, often, it is true, of a plain and homely kind, and with that sincerity and earnestness of manner which carried conviction, he was perhaps one of the most successful jury lawyers we ever had in the state. He always tried a case fairly and honestly. He never intentionally misrepresented the evidence of a witness, nor the argument of an opponent. He met both squarely, and if he could not explain the one or answer the other, substantially admitted it. He never misstated the law according to his own intelligent view of it. Such was the transparent candor and integrity of his nature that he could not well or strongly argue a side or a cause that he thought wrong. Of course he felt it his duty to say what could be said, and to leave the decision to others, but there could be seen in such cases the inward struggle of his mind. In trying a case he might occasionally dwell too long upon, or give too much importance to, an inconsiderable point, but this was the exception, and generally he went straight to the citadel of the cause or question, and struck home there, knowing if that were won, the outworks would necessarily fall. He could hardly be called very learned in his profession, and yet he rarely tried a case without fully understanding the law applicable to it, and I have no hesitation in saying he was one of the ablest lawyers I have ever known. If he was forcible before a jury, he was equally so with the court. He detected with unerring sagacity the weak points of an opponent's argument, and pressed his own views with overwhelming strength. His efforts were quite unequal, and it might happen that he would not, on some occasions, strike one as at all remarkable. But let him be thoroughly roused, let him feel that he was right, and some principle was involved in his cause, and he would come out with an earnestness of conviction, a power of argument, a wealth of illustration that I have never seen surpassed. This is nothing less than the portrait of a great lawyer, drawn by competent hands, with a lifelong habit of conscientious accuracy. If we chose to continue, we could fill this volume with the tributes of his professional associates, ranging all the way from the commonplaces of condolence to the most extravagant eulogy. But enough has been quoted to justify the tradition which Lincoln left behind him at the bar of Illinois. His weak, as well as his strong qualities, have been indicated. He never learned the technicalities, what some would call the tricks, of the profession. The slight of plea and demur, the legerdemain by which justice is balked, and a weak case is made to gain an unfair advantage, was too subtle and shifty for his strong and straightforward intelligence. He met those maneuvers sufficiently well, when practiced by others, but he could never get in the way of handling them for himself. On the wrong side he was always weak. He knew this himself, and avoided such cases when he could, consistently with the rules of his profession. He would often persuade a fair-minded litigant of the injustice of his case and induce him to give it up. His partner, Mr. Herndon, relates a speech in point which Lincoln once made to a man who offered him an objectionable case. Yes, there is no reasonable doubt but that I can gain your case for you. I can set a whole neighborhood at loggerheads. I can distress a widowed mother and her six fatherless children, and thereby get for you six hundred dollars, which rightfully belongs, it appears to me, as much to them as it does to you. I shall not take your case but I will give a little advice for nothing. You seem a sprightly, energetic man. I would advise you to try your hand at making six hundred dollars in some other way. Sometimes, after he had entered upon a criminal case, the conviction that his client was guilty would affect him with a sort of panic. On one occasion he turned suddenly to his associate and said, Sweat, the man is guilty. You defend him, I can't, and so gave up his share of a large fee. The same thing happened at another time when he was engaged with Judge S. C. Parks in defending a man accused of larceny. He said, If you can say anything for the man, do it. I can't. If I attempt it, the jury will see I think he is guilty and convict him. 
Once he was prosecuting a civil suit, in the course of which evidence was introduced, showing that his client was attempting a fraud. Lincoln rose and went to his hotel in deep disgust. The judge sent for him. He refused to come. Tell the judge, he said, my hands are dirty. I came over to wash them. We are aware that these stories detract something from the character of the lawyer, but this inflexible, inconvenient, and fastidious morality was to be of vast service afterwards to his country and the world. The nemesis which waits upon the men of extraordinary wit and humor had not neglected Mr. Lincoln, and the young lawyers of Illinois, who never knew him, have an endless store of jokes and pleasantries in his name, some of them as old as the Howell-Glass or Rabelais. Footnote. As a specimen of these stories, we give the following well-vouched for, as apocrypha generally are. Lincoln met one day on the courthouse steps a young lawyer who had lost a case, his only one, and looked very disconsolate. "'What has become of your case?' Lincoln asked. "'Gone to H,' was the gloomy response. "'Well, don't give it up,' Lincoln rejoined cheerfully. "'You can try it again there. A quip which has been attributed to many wits in many ages— and will doubtless make the reputation of jesters yet to be. End of footnote. But the fact is that with all his stories and jests, his frank companionable humor, his gift of easy accessibility and welcome, he was, even while he traveled the Eighth Circuit, a man of grave and serious temper, and of an unusual innate dignity and reserve. He had few or no special intimates, and there was a line beyond which no one ever thought of passing. Besides, he was too strong a man in the courtroom to be regarded with anything but respect in a community in which legal ability was the only especial mark of distinction. Few of his forensic speeches have been preserved, but his contemporaries all agree as to their singular ability and power. He seemed absolutely at home in a courtroom. His great stature did not encumber him there. It seemed like a natural symbol of superiority. His bearing and gesticulation had no awkwardness about them. They were simply striking and original. He assumed at the start a frank and friendly relation with the jury, which was extremely effective. He usually began, as the phrase ran, by giving away his case, by allowing to the opposite side every possible advantage that they could honestly and justly claim. Then he would present his own side of the case, with a clearness, a candor, and adroitness of statement, which at once flattered and convinced the jury, and made even the bystanders his partisans. Sometimes he disturbed the court with laughter by his humorous or apt illustrations. Sometimes he excited the audience by that florid and exuberant rhetoric, which he knew well enough how and when to indulge in. But his more usual and more successful manner was to rely upon a clear, strong, lucid statement, keeping details in proper subordination, and bringing forward, in a way which fastened the attention of the court and jury alike, the essential point on which he claimed a decision." Indeed, says one of his colleagues, his statement often rendered argument unnecessary, and often the court would stop him and say, If that is the case, we will hear the other side. Whatever doubts might be entertained as to whether he was the ablest lawyer on the circuit, there was never any dissent from the opinion that he was the one most cordially and universally liked. If he did not himself enjoy his full share of the happiness of life, he certainly diffused more of it among his fellows, than is in the power of most men. His arrival was a little festival in the county seats, where his pursuits led him to pass so much of his time. Several eyewitnesses have described these scenes in terms which would seem exaggerated if they were not so fully confirmed. The bench and bar would gather at the tavern where he was expected, to give him a cordial welcome, says one writer. He brought light with him. This is not hard to understand. Whatever his cares, he never inflicted them upon others. He talked singularly well, but never about himself. He was full of wit, which never wounded, of humor which mellowed the harshness of that new and raw life of the prairies. He never asked for help, but was always ready to give it. He received everybody's confidence, and rarely gave his own in return. He took no mean advantages in court or in conversation, and, satisfied with the kind respect and kindliness which he everywhere met, he sought no quarrels, and seldom had to decline them. He did not accumulate wealth. As Judge Davis says, he seemed never to care for it. He had a good income from his profession, though the fees he received would bring a smile to the well-paid lips of the great attorneys of today. 
the largest fee he ever got, was one of $5,000 from the Illinois Central Railway, and he had to bring suit to compel them to pay it. He spent what he received in the education of his children, in the care of his family, and in a plain and generous way of living. One who often visited him writes, referring to the old-fashioned hospitality of Springfield, Among others I recall, with a sad pleasure, the dinners and evening parties given by Mrs. Lincoln. In her modest and simple home, where everything was so orderly and refined, there was always on the part of both host and hostess a cordial and hearty western welcome, which put every guest perfectly at ease. The table was framed for the excellence of many rare Kentucky dishes, and for the venison, wild turkeys, and other game, then so abundant. Yet it was her genial manner, and ever-kind welcome, and Mr. Lincoln's wit and humor, anecdote and unrivaled conversation, which formed the chief attraction. Here we leave them for a while, in this peaceful and laborious period of his life, engaged in useful and congenial toil, surrounded by the love and respect of the entire community, in the fullness of his years and strength, the struggles of his youth, which were so easy to his active brain and his mighty muscles, all behind him, and the titanic labors of his manhood yet to come. We shall now try to sketch the beginnings of that tremendous controversy which he was in a few years to take up, to guide and direct to its wonderful and tragical close. End of section 17